All right, I will share my screen here. Can everybody see the presentation? Or can you see it, Maggie, at least? Oh. Yeah? Yeah. OK. All right, good. So like Maggie said, uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research we've done um, just on carp removal and how it affects water quality and sediment, and then how carp can affect um, things like aluminum treatment. So the first study I'm going to talk about, this is it's about Pickerel Lake in Minnesota down in Albert Lee, or just outside of Albert Lee. And um, uh, Rotenone was used in 2009 uh, to kill all the fish in the lake, and then the, the native species were restocked. Um, and then we looked at um, changes in water quality, macrophytes, and other things, and then changes to sediment um, before and after removal. Um, and that was a study. Yeah, Prashemic was on that study, and then Steve Kittleson from the DNR helped us out with macrophyte data, and Scott Christensen down in the watershed district there, Shell River Watershed District, and then Kevin Mankin at Bar Engineering. And they provided lab space and, and uh, helped out because uh, the first part of the study I did while I was at Bar Engineering, and the second part I flew back to Minnesota to uh, do the second half. So... Pickerel Lake, it's a pretty shallow lake. It's pretty large, 281 hectares, um, a lot of egg in the watershed. Um, and it was a hypereutrophic lake. I'll show a little bit of data um, on that in, the sec in a sec here. Um, development began like probably everywhere else. I won't go through all of this. Um, in the mid 1800s, um, there were some measures, fish removal, lake drawdown, uh, nothing really worked or had a really short longevity. And uh, carp has been a major contributor to poor water quality for quite a long time. So we went out and collected cores from a number of lakes um, for Shell Rock River Watershed District back in 2009, right before I left for Sweden. And I uh, did some potential internal phosphorus loading estimates, which weren't that high, but for shallow lakes, they it's fairly high, at least 3.9 milligrams per meter squared per day. Um, but the estimated internal loading from carp uh, was significantly higher for Pickerel Lake. Um, and that was estimated based on a biomass density of between 1,000 and 1,500 kilograms per hectare of carp. Um, that's over the carrying capacity of the lake, meaning that total fish biomass should be uh, somewhere around five to 600 kilograms per hectare of carp. So I don't know how realistic that is. No actual biomass density calculations were made um, it's just word of mouth and some estimates from people who worked at the DNR a long time ago. Uh, Rotenone was added in late 2009, and as I mentioned, the native fish species were restocked. So cores were collected from the same exact location. So the figure on the right is Pickerel Lake, and the X's there show where we, collect, we collected sediment cores. We collected in 2009 and then 2018 um, at the same time in May um, for both... Uh, sampling periods. And then we looked at different phosphorus forms in sediment, both the ones labile and non-labile. So the forms of phosphorus that can be released and the ones that probably can't. And then we had lots of good water quality data. Uh, we pulled in fish data from 2008 and 2013, and then macro macrophytes. Uh, we didn't have that for every year, but we had quite a bit of macrophyte data, so that was good. So as I mentioned before, there were a lot of carp. We don't know exactly, but um, Prajama came up with this equation. So if you look at catch per unit effort, um, you can estimate biomass, but the catch per unit effort was outside his study range by quite a bit. And that would give you estimated biomass of 3,100 kilograms per hectare. Um, probably not that high, but the thresholds for ecosystem disruption um, were definitely over that. It's There are different estimates for these. Um, different parameters, but um, 1.4 kilograms per net. So we were quite a bit higher than that. Um, and here I'm just showing the fish species distribution from 2008, the red bars, and then 2013 after carp removal. Um, and you can see the carp dominated the system uh, before rote known treatment. And this is a lot of data, but I don't, I'm not gonna go through all these different species. I'm not good at most of the names anyway. Um, but I wanted to show uh, 
if we look at the bottom here, we've got sample stations, then percent vegetated, and then number of species going across those different columns. So before treatment, especially in 2009, no uh, aquatic plants were detected at all. Um, and then you can see already in June 2010, so about six months after treatment, that you've got 32.4% coverage, and already in August of that year, it goes up to 100. And it held pretty constant until 2016, um, and where it dropped uh, quite a bit. But both coverage and um, species number increased, which was good. Um, so the lake basically shifted from an algal dominated system to a macrophyte dominated system. This, this alternative stable states theory, either you have a lot of algae or a lot of plants. So yeah, just some numbers here, coverage increased, number of species increased, um, but we only had two sampling points before treatment. So uh, we don't really know for sure. And then management of curly leaf pondweed, of course was ongoing. So that probably had some effect. <clears throat> But again, a complete recolonization of the lake happened after road known treatment. So it was quite a huge shift. So now onto the water quality. This is just a, um, a box plot graph. So the boxes, um, there's two boxes for each variable. So we got chlorophyll A, total phosphorus, turbidity, and secchi depth here. So the first box is pretreatment. So you can see chlorophyll A, the dashed lines are means and the solid lines are horizontal lines are medians, big drops here. Um, total phosphorus decreased, turbidity decreased. I don't have phosphate on here, SRP, but it showed about the same. I think it might be in the graph below. And of course, secchi depth increased substantially. There's SRP. Um, so I've got the first row here is the mean pretreatment average. And then the second row is the mean post-treatment average. So you can see the declines there. And then I have percent change. Um, and as I said, it wasn't just particulate phosphorus, sediment being kicked up by the carp. It was actually um, soluble phosphorus decreased quite a bit too. So Brian, we had a question on the last slide in the chat. Oh. Um, it was, they were wondering if you tra transplanted aquatic plants or did macrophytes come back just from the seed bank? Yeah, that's a good question. I was thinking about that as I was going on my lunchtime walk today. And um, the lake was affected for a really long time by carp, and I assume further back before we had data. Um, but I don't think, I haven't heard that there was any sort of uh, plantings going on. So I'm not sure how the seed bank managed to uh, stay alive, I guess. I don't, for lack of a better word, I'm not a biologist, but um, yeah, I, um, I don't know. Um, but it, I have not heard of any planting. So it, it should have just been from recolonization from seeds in the sediment bed, which is strange because I, I think they don't last forever, but. Great, thanks Brian. Yeah. So here's another messy sciencey graph I just copied out of the paper. But on this up, upper panel here, I have the dashed line represents road known treatment. And then I have chlorophyll A in the dark circles and total phosphorus in the open circles. And then on the bottom graph, the dark circle is turbidity and the white circles or open circles are secchi depth. And these are mean, annual means from May to September every year. And you can see again, the, the drop and also the variability declined quite a bit um, in most cases. So secchi depth was in many cases down to the bottom or the sediment surface. So that's probably, a, I mean, that's going to be an underestimate, but um, it's a shallow lake. So big changes um, in water quality. So now onto the sediment. So again, we collected cores in 2009 and 2018, and we focused on two different types of phosphorus in the sediment, the labile fraction to the directly releasable, we call it mobile and then labile organic phosphorus. So that's labile and that's phosphorus that can come out of the sediment during internal loading events. And then we have the recalcitrant forms, um, basically stable forms in sediment, aluminum bound phosphorus, calcium bound phosphorus, and a portion of the organic matter. Um, and we lose both concentration and mass of phosphorus in the sediment. This gets a little bit tricky, but um, well, it's not tricky. It's just hard to explain. 
concentration tells you how many phosphorus par units are on a uh, sediment particle, whereas mass tells you how much phosphorus is in the upper two centimeters of sediment. So, and here I have two graphs. So I'm showing sediment depth on the y-axis and then the different, these different labile fractions, mobile phosphorus and organic phosphorus on the x-axis here. Um, so these are averages of the seven cores we collected. So the dark circles are from before carpal removed, and that is not how uh, eutrophic or hypereutrophic lake sediment looks like. Um, I'd never seen that before, which is why I became interested in this particular project. And then the open circles are after carp removal. So you can see there's a big difference. There's much more mobile phosphorus in the sediment. So the carp were basically acting as a pump, pushing it out continuously. Uh, the same thing for organic matter, but that takes time to build up and accumulate in the sediment. So we only saw a significant change in the upper two centimeter layer. Um, yeah. And this is just to show you that it wasn't one core, all the cores. So the red is after removal and the blue is before removal. And the they're not all the same, but the trend is the same. There was no spot in the lake where we didn't see this. <clears throat> so we took, um, we looked at the amount of lay biophosphorus in the sediment, both mobile and organic in the upper 10 centimeters, and compared that, the increase to the decrease in phosphorus in the lake. Uh, pre and post treatment, and they were very similar. Um, so you see the lead, the sediment here is the average of these seven cores, the difference. And then for the water, we compared annual each annual mean to the pre treatment value. So we also got seven values there. Um, yeah, the figure tells it all. The instead of the phosphorus being in the water due to carp, it's in the sediment now. So. What happened? I kind of already talked about this, but um, there's there was a physical transport, basically a pump of phosphorus um, from the sediment. And carp can mix down to about 20 centimeters. I'll talk about this in just a little bit. There's also increased breakdown of organic matter and phosphorus release from that. And of course, there's excretion. Um, there are indirect effects. The reduced macrophyte coverage um, before removal, um, macrophytes stabilize the water column and sediment. So you, if you take them away, you get more internal loading generally just because of that. And um, yeah, less sediment resuspension after um, carp removal and lower velocity at the sediment, water velocity at the sediment water interface will reduce the internal loading. Maybe some oxygen leakage from roots. I don't know if that really had a big impact. But there are other factors too. So it wasn't just the removal of carp. It was what happened after the removal of carp. And of course, there are other things that will increase variability in the results um, in the future. So summary, sharp declines in nutrients and nutrient-related variables like chlorophyll A. Um, also turbidity declined quite a bit. Um, I already talked about that. We cut off the nutrient pump. And of course, macrophytes now dominate the lake. The question is if this is going to be a long-term effect. Often when we do these types of biomanipulation projects, it lasts for maybe a couple of years. But um, if nutrients are still in excess, uh, those types of treatments don't last very long. You have basically have to reduce the nutrients first uh, and then go on and remove carp. But it, it still looks pretty good now. Um, I don't have all the data after 2016, um, but at least I think total phosphorus looked okay and secchi depth um okay so now i just want to talk a little bit about some data we have from sweden um fish removal and here it's bream um not so much carp that we have problems with so the figure on the right is lower sweden so we're talking about the city of Växjö. um and if you want to relate i live up here this green uh, <laughs> uh point here up towards the top in the middle on the right figure, and then Stockholm was covered up. All these little yellow spots are where we've gone out and collected sediment. I couldn't get them off the map. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Vekkohorn, the arrows pointing to that lake, and then also Sedra Beriundohorn. So both these lakes have been treated with aluminum now and had fish removal um, done. And this is Vekkohorn, this nice little town. I think it's called the greenest city in Europe. I don't know if that's still the case, but... Uh, environmentally, it's also quite green color-wise, but uh, Vekwakern is a small deep lake 
um, or stratified lake, but it's a very small area that's actually stratified. So you've got both internal loading from sediment, phosphorus, and then you've got carp effects. So fish were removed from 2016 to 2017 and the first split dose, so we split doses to improve binding efficiency, uh, was conducted in 2018. So now I didn't have time to change the Swedish on these figures, I'm sorry, but it's concentration of total phosphorus on the y-axis here. So all these bars are showing that. And then the years on the bottom and the light blue on the left is before any measures. And then the dark blue in the middle is after fish removal, carp removal, um, or bream. And then the green is after aluminum treatment. So you can see the carp removal had an effect, but the two in combination were much better. And these are just showing the same thing, but uh, monthly averages. Um, and you can see that the carp removal didn't have such a great effect during the summer months, but that's because there was direct phosphorus release from the sediment um, due to low oxygen concentrations. So we needed to do both um, in this case. And we found a couple surprising things. Uh, we looked at heavy metals before and after treatment and the titles on this table uh, are still in Swedish, I'm sorry, but the element names at least are the same. Aluminum, arsenic, lead, cadmium, cobalt, copper, chromium, nickel, and zinc. So during treatment, this was actually an, a combination of sediment injection of the aluminum mineral and um, some application of water to precipitate phosphorus that had already been released from the sediment. So even aluminum itself changed or dropped. Um, arsenic didn't drop during the summer, but it's affected by redox or low oxygen. So that was during, and then this is after treatment. You can see we had pretty high declines in um, heavier trace metals. So that was good. Uh, we've actually seen that in other lakes in um, Coleman and Harriet too, but only for aluminum. I don't think they tested a lot of other metals. Um, and here we have pHs. So in this figure down here, the blue bars show pHs in sediment pore water. Um, in areas of a small bay that weren't treated, and then the red bars show the concentrations of those same PAHs in the treated areas. Uh, and you can see for the most part, there are huge differences, um, less PAH uh, concentration in the pore water, in the sediment. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, the first part will be about Coleman Lake um, in St. Paul. And um, yeah, we looked at, internal loading, sediment mixing depth, and the effect of carp on uh, sediment release and aluminum treatment. And it was myself, Prezemek, um, Christopher Chizinski, and Peter Sorensen who were involved in this study. So Coleman Lake is another shallow uh, polymictic lake. This was also a split treatment uh, that we did. Two different, two doses at 39 grams per meter squared of aluminum. And on the figure on the right, I'm showing the lake uh, you can see the depth curves and where cores were collected and the these little circular or oval areas are where we installed x closures to keep carp out so these were installed just after the first application so the idea here was to use aluminum as a tracer of sediment mixing depth or the active depth of the sediment uh, biodensity wasn't that high but the average carp size was uh fairly high um and the bigger the carp are the uh, deeper they can dig into the sediment. And so now the figure on the right is just showing the average sediment mixing depth. So how far down that aluminum got pushed into the sediment. So we can see for the X closures, it was uh, about four and a half centimeters. So with no carp, and then the three areas of the lake we sampled that were totally open to carp, uh, we got between 14 and 16 centimeters average. One core was down to 22 centimeters. Um, so yeah, there's about a threefold increase in the penetration depth or basically a threefold increase in the depth of sediment that will react with the water. Uh, the original aluminum dose was based on an active sediment depth of six centimeters. So this treatment will probably not last as long as expected. And here on this figure, I'm just showing the cumulative mass of mobile phosphorus so at four centimeters in three different areas of the lake there's this much and then when you go to six centimeters so zero to six centimeters zero to eight zero to ten zero to twelve zero to fourteen so as soon as you start increasing that mixing depth of course the amount of phosphorus that can be released increases 
And we're looking at between two and three times more phosphorus can be released in the presence of carp here. So that's a big problem. One benefit, it appears that carp seem to improve binding efficiency. So after you add aluminum, it forms an amorphous mineral that then begins to crystallize um, over time. And, but if this happens in the absence of P or before P gets bound to that mineral, it reduces the binding efficiency. And the longer it takes, the more the binding efficiency is reduced. Um, so sediment mixing basically just increases the chance for contact between aluminum and phosphorus. So we showed that binding efficiency was approximately two times greater in Coleman Lake compared to Lake Calhoun, which similar doses were used, at least for the first dose in Coleman. It was 39, I think, and Calhoun was 42. Um, but this is only short-term binding efficiency. That's going to change over time. More and more phosphorus will bind to that mineral. So both lakes could be similar now. I don't know. Um, more studies needed. That's what researchers always have to say. Um, otherwise, we lose our jobs. Um, now, here's a study I did, and this is kind of one of the reasons why I went back to academia and left consulting, is that we would do these types of restoration projects, and people would ask, well, how long will an aluminum treatment last? And we'd say, well, I don't know, between 10 and 20 years, uh, 20 if you're lucky, 10 if you're unlucky, but it wasn't a real answer. And if you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, it feels kind of bad to not be able to <clears throat> tell somebody how long it's going to last. <clears throat> So this is one of the reasons why I came out. I had other questions with internal loading and lake modeling and stuff, but this is one of the big ones. So I'm just going to, I don't know how much people know about aluminum, so I'm just going to give a really brief background here. So it's been used for over 50 years to reduce internal loading. Uh, first lake reported anyway was Longhorn here, treated in 1968 in Stockholm, and it's actually been treated two times since then. Um, it's, it's just too hard to reduce the external loading to a natural level. So the internal loading comes back. The aluminum or phosphorus is still stuck to the aluminum from the old treatments, but more phosphorus comes into the lake. There are likely thousands of treatments. Hundreds have been documented. It's, aluminum has been used in drinking water treatment for over 200 years. Why do we use it? Excess phosphorus in the sediment without enough binders to keep it in the sediment. Iron can be used, but of course that releases phosphorus in our low oxygen conditions and calcium is better suited at higher pH 8 and above. <clears throat> and again, it just forms a natural mineral that's already found in soil and sediment. Um, and just little fun facts about aluminum. It's, I'm, I'm not a big fan of aluminum, but it's, it's, we eat it every day. It's found in antacids, baking powder, um, even deodorant. And you, I don't know if you can see on the picture, but it says on the front, no aluminum, aluminum chlorohydrate. Um, and I actually went into a store where I, a, a friend I know, um, she was working there at the time. And so I was just going to pick up some deodorant. And I thought this crystal stuff looked good. And she's like, oh, yeah, this is really good. There's no aluminum in it. And I'm like, is that bad for you? And she's like, oh, yeah. So I looked at the ingredients on the back. And about midway through, I, the, one of the ingredients was alum. So that's aluminum sulfate. So it's true that there's no aluminum chlorohydrate in that crystal stick, but there's aluminum sulfate. So, and then I told her that and she felt bad because she was telling a lot of people that there was no aluminum in that stick. Um, so it doesn't bioaccumulate. It's often called a chemical treatment, but it's actually a mineral treatment. Once that aluminum hits the water, it forms a mineral. Um, yeah, and I already mentioned this. It eventually becomes gibbsite. And maybe we'll look something like that after a long time. And then how does it work? This is all we're doing. We're starting from a natural state we're trying to get back to that, where binding capacity of the sediment prevents uh, release of phosphorus. There's always a little bit of internal loading in most lakes, uh, but not much. And here we have after excess loading of phosphorus has occurred to the lake. Binding capacity, there's just not enough binding capacity to keep the phosphorus in the sediment. And so then with aluminum treatment, we restore that balance between binding capacity and the amount of phosphorus in the sediment. Okay. That's it for my background. So back to this study, one of the reasons why I came back to research or academics, I've got a figure here showing, and it's on a log scale, but I have in green uh, the real years, not the log years. Um, on the y-axis, it's the measured longevity. So how long did the treatment actually last? And then on the x, it's predicted. So we came up with an equation to predict longevity based on aluminum dose, which was the strongest factor, 
and then watershed area to lake area, this ratio here. Um, and that's, it's not really the watershed area and the lake area. It's more the proportion of external loading to internal loading, especially if external loading has not been reduced. And then of course, lake type has an effect. The lower amount of internal loading will have a stronger effect in shallow lakes because as soon as that phosphorus leaves the sediment, it's available for uptake. So, however, if we add in the carp lakes now, so we have the, all the dark triangles are the, the carp lakes with moderate to high densities of carp. For the most part, um, longevity, the actual longevity was much lower than predicted. Um, there are a couple exceptions. There's two green lakes here. It's the same lake in Seattle. Um, I actually core that lake during my master's, but um, it was treated in 1991 and there was no, it was based on old treatment dosing methods, but also there was no consideration of what carp do in the sediment. In 2004, they increased the treatment depth because they know that carp, they knew that carp um, will affect the active sediment layer. And that one is actually not statistically different than the model. And Susan is, it's it's diamictic. Some years it's polyamictic. Um, so that's why that one's up there. But then you see these other ones and they're severely underpredicted. If you're looking from zero to a hundred years, um, Sunfish, Long Lake and Hennepin County and some other lakes. But there are some things to think about here. Most of these lakes, as I mentioned, were underdosed using older aluminum dosing methods. So that of course, it's going to affect longevity if you don't bind all that mobile phosphorus. Um, lakes were weighted, there's a typo, uh, more strongly if no other measures were done. So we we're just looking at the aluminum treatment effect. But lakes that had no external reductions, so still high external loading, lakes that didn't have carp removal, those were given more weight. So it, it may be, it was good for science, but it may be not so good for a real world application. Uh, longevity of an aluminum treatment. The word shouldn't even exist or be related because if you reduce external loading to background levels, um, aluminum binds phosphorus permanently. And so a, a, a treatment should last forever as long as you do that. And we have another, a number of cases here in Sweden where internal loading hasn't increased at all uh, for up to 20 years or more. But in a lot of cases, like in the middle of Stockholm where they're doing one treatment every 20 years or something like that now, um, it's just too expensive uh, to reduce external loading, at least now with the technology we have. So, um, yeah, so just to sum up, um, these few studies I talked about, um, carp reduce longevity of aluminum treatment. And there are another, a number of reasons for this. The main one being that carp increase the active layer of sediment through sediment mixing. So the amount of phosphorus that can be released increases quite a bit in most cases. They also increase the mineralization rate of organic matter. So aerobic degradation is faster than anaerobic. And this has, an inter we've found this out now, we're doing some other research um, and we've seen that pH can drop drastically in the sediment uh, due to increased microbial mineralization. So you basically have a, a more CO2 carbon dioxide in the water, which drops the pH. When that happens, you start getting release of calcium bond phosphorus, which we typically think of as permanently bound or recalcitrant. And now we've seen this in, while well, it's been mostly in the lab, but um, we've seen it under some fish farms too in some core incubation experiments. So I don't know, we, we still have to look at that. It might be less important out in the, in the real world because you have a lot more water mixing in the lake so that pH drop will be buffered by that additional water um, and alkalinity. But one of the things in cases where carp can't be removed, you can adjust aluminum dose for that uh, increase in active sediment depth. So it's not, it's not that you can't use aluminum if you can't get all the carp removed or if carp will eventually come back, you can compensate for it. But of course that costs more money. Um, and we typically like to avoid spending excess money um, doing these type of projects, but it can be compensated for. So, um, yeah. And again, I just want to thank Barr for letting me come back and use their lab for free. And also Kevin Menken for helping me run some of the samples. Um, and then Shell Rock River and Ramsey, Washington Metro Watershed Districts for funding coring studies and um, basically this half research, half management type stuff. 
And of course, the DNR for their fish and macrophyte survey data. That was Steve Kittleson for the macrophytes. And if you want these articles, I can send them to Maggie. Um, but you can just Google my name, and I usually come up quickly. And most of these are open access articles, except for one. So I'll just send the articles that I talked about today to Maggie, and she can send them to you. Or you can email me um, if you want. And that's it. I think I can open it up for questions. Brian, uh, this is Tom Langer, Minneapolis Creek Watershed District. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I thought it was very informative and, and very applicable um, to, I think, what a lot of us watershed managers face, or at least uh, I think some of the tools that we consider. One of the questions that I have that I've been trying to dig into more is <clears throat> somewhat on this or related to this, diving into what I can see in the literature, <clears throat> some of this carp mixing interaction, trying to pinpoint at what point or in the depth of a lake do carp not really cause mixing, cause the sediment. So in your research and in, in this finding, were predominantly a lot of these lakes shallow and um or were some of them deeper lakes i know you kind of pointed out susan um i'm not familiar obviously with any of the other ones on here but mm -hmm. yes can you speak to that a little bit where where carp might be in a system but where we apply alum might be you know five meters or four meters or or deeper in a lake and that's from my understanding, not common place for carp to really be hanging out. So um, just trying to pick your thoughts on that a little bit, that relationship with as depth increases, um, how might this carp alum influence follow suit? Yeah, sure. That's a good question. And if you look at this figure, um, most of these lakes, except for Susan, are fairly shallow. Um, I can't remember long in Hennepin. It's been so long since I core that. Like, I think it might stratify, but uh, it also has large shallower areas, if I remember correctly. But otherwise, all these lakes are pretty shallow. Um, and uh, Prejemic has shown this with Susan. Now, they did a carp removal there, and uh, they saw some effect, but it, it definitely wasn't what you would expect. Uh, so basically, the carp removal didn't really have a big impact. And that was most likely due to the fact that that lake stratified and most or a good portion of the phosphorus was coming uh, from, I, I don't know what you call it, regular <laughs> sediment release. But if we go back up to this um, back quick run here, I'm going to have to start my presentation maybe again because I've got multiple there. So on this deeper area here, the carp aren't going to be there for the most case because it's stratified and you have low oxygen. So they're not going to. They're not going to go there if they don't have to. So um, so we had these two uh, types of internal loading here. And you can see from this figure that yeah, carp removal had a, some effect, but not a, a big effect. And it definitely want to help the lake heat it, heat, meet its goals. So in this case, this stratified lake was very similar to Susan, that it needed the aluminum treatment to get it over the goal line. Carp removal helped and also reduced the cost for the aluminum treatment because you have less sediment mixing. Um, but it was a, a lake that stratifies, so the carp aren't going to go into that deeper area. And because it stratifies, internal loading is more of a problem. Although internal loading can be quite high in um, shadow lakes too. Um, it's not just release from iron under low oxygen conditions. It's breakdown of organic matter that also contributes to internal loading. But I think uh, most studies have shown if you have a deep stratified lake, carp aren't going to have a big effect. Um, because they're mostly hanging out in the shallow areas eating benthic invertebrates. And when you have a stratified lake, um, they may have, this is just speculation, but if you restore a lake and oxygen conditions improve in deeper areas, they might start going down there. But um, it's hard to say. You definitely won't have the same turbidity effect because the sediment's not going to uh, move all the way up to the surface. But um, yeah, I, I think it's pretty clear that if you in stratified lakes, carp removal doesn't have the same effect. Um, it could still be beneficial, like I said, for aluminum treatment. Um, you can weigh the cost of carp removal and a, a smaller or lower aluminum amount um, because you have a shallower active sediment depth. But yeah, 
I hope that it, answers your question. It, it, yeah, no, thank you. I, I appreciate the insights and um, taking your, your expertise on the topic. I think just one follow-up thought to that or question, and then I'll let others pipe in. Um, are you aware of any studies or have you been involved in any where you did say the alum treatment first and then after the fact you had to go back in and do removals or some long, longer term monitoring to see uh, those situations where maybe the alum was done first? Um, and this is more just pointed on the thought, uh, I guess, more of, I think, the order of operations that I'm familiar with in uh, is try to do the carp removal first, then go in and do the alum treatment. Mm. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's any examples where that's been reversed or uh, that you're aware of. Not that I know, but that's a really good point because if you do a carp removal before uh, you lower nutrient concentrations in the lake, they're gonna recruitment is gonna happen much faster. So it, I think um, that it would be better to do an aluminum treatment first and then get the carp out shortly thereafter. You get some increased binding efficiency maybe, but, or, or both, you just start carp removal before, treat with aluminum, keep going with the removal um, after, because if there's too much food in the lake, they're gonna come back really fast, depending on some other factors. But if the lake is still eutrophic, the recruitment happens quite quickly. Great, thanks. So Brian, this is Brian Vlock from Three Rivers Park District. Um, very interesting information, appreciate it. Um, I also had similar um, question with Tom, you know, uh, that just kind of presented where we're treating lakes at, um, that are stratified. We're focusing on the deeper areas of the lake because they have the highest P release. And so um, this issue also came up with us with regards to carp impacts in those particular situations. Um, I thought it was really interesting that um, the binding capacity improved when you had the presence of carp and, um, you know, at deeper sediment depths. And so um, I guess my, my question with that is, you know, your alum effectiveness study um, that I've read, um, indicates that a lot of those lakes were underdosed and um, the overall alum effectiveness seemed to be strongly related to the um, dosage basically um, yes. with a lot of those lakes in terms of how long the alum was effective. And so I guess um, with that in mind, you kind of, with those two concepts in mind, I guess one of the things I was wondering about, you mentioned the term uh, sediment injection, I believe, of alum. Yes. Um, is that something that you have done before? Um, what type of lakes and um, how is it done to increase overall binding capacity of the phosphorus with the alum? Um, similar to what you experienced, I guess, with the improved in, improvement in binding capacity when you had carp um, basically redistributing the alum into deeper part of the sediment, I guess. So kind of curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a method that's commonly used here in Sweden. It's one company that does it. They, uh, it's called Vatten Research. And uh, they've been doing it since, uh, oh, for 20 years, since 2000. And um, the, the idea is you minimize the effects on biota in the water, but then you can also inject at different depths. You can inject from zero to four centimeters, zero to 10, zero to 12, basically whatever you want. Um, it's it's about double the cost, but it does appear, uh, one of our PhD students now has a paper. You guys can email me for this paper too. Um, he showed that it does increase the binding efficiency. So the cost of the treatment with respect to dollars per pound phosphorus bound in the sediment is can be similar. Um, it seems to work well, especially in shallow lakes where you're worried about distribution of that aluminum flock after you add the, the treatment. Um, but yeah, it's it's it takes longer. Like a three-week treatment would take about three months. Um, and that's just because they can't... You have a much lower volume of water in the sediment to buffer the aluminum as it's making the mineral. So we always use buffered um, pack polyaluminum chloride compounds here. Um, but there's there's no 100% buffered aluminum compound. Um, so you, they mix lake water 
inject so let's say a, a treatment was well, maybe 80 grams per meter squared so they'll go by and add maybe 15 to 20. so they mix the aluminum with lake water and then they inject it at the depths that you want um, and then they come back maybe two or three months later do the same thing um, so there's time for that sediment to sort of recover um, and we've shown that there there isn't the ph does drop but it drops to maybe 6.5 or 6.8 which is actually good because maximum binding between aluminum and phosphorus is around 6.5 so it seems to work well there's not a lot of study on the actual impacts um i, th I would think benthic invertebrates probably are impacted more maybe that way maybe not um but in terms of phosphorus binding it seems to improve binding efficiency so is that your primary application now in Sweden is, you know, what you're going to describe the sediment injection, I guess, is what you're calling it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, it depends. So we've done quite a few projects for Stockholm City. And there you have a lot of pHs and PCBs and underground pipes and electric cables in the sediment. So there it's about 50-50. Um, we choose water treatment when there's just stuff you don't want to kick up in the sediment or there's old boats down there. Yeah. Um, whatever. So, um, but for the most part, it's the dominant, I'd say it's probably 75, 80% of all treatments are sediment injection here. And it's double the price. I hear what you're saying. It's double the price, but it, that's in total cost. If you look at cost per pound or kilogram phosphorus bound, then it's closer to the same, but it's still more expensive. It just takes more time. That's all. So, so have you measured the overall alum um, binding capacity in the sediments um, compared to like uh, surface application versus your um, what you're calling sediment injection, I guess, uh, is it, uh, is the binding capacity improving deeper into the sediments by applying it deeper in the water column, I guess is kind of what I'm asking. Yes, but it, it, it depends. Um, we see, especially in lakes that have steep sediment, sediment bed slopes that the binding efficiency improves because instead of the aluminum flock being on the sediment and then quickly going down into the middle of the lake, it's injected into the sediment and moves naturally with sediment towards deeper areas of the lake. It's a little, it's, I don't know if we saw such a big difference. I, I can uh, give that paper to Maggie too. Um, it's also open access um, and it's on my Google uh, scholar and research gate and stuff. If you just look me up, but I'll send the paper to Maggie and um, yeah, or you can email me directly. So it was, but it was a small study that where we had long enough data series um, to look at longevity. So we couldn't really say anything statistically, um, but well, we did actually, um, but it, it was just Sweden. It was just a small number of lakes. So I, I think it would be nice if we had more data, but we did see differences. Wow. That's great. Thank you much. I appreciate that information. So very useful. Sure. sure. See, Brian, uh, Matt Koshin with Rice Creek Watershed. I, I had a question about a couple of your early um, graphs from Pickerel Lake. Yeah. Uh, the, the early graphs that showed the changes in sediment chemistry before and after. Yeah, those. Yeah. I was, I was um, getting a bit concerned when you, when you presented these that these could be like a cautionary tale for interpreting sediment cores when carp are present um, but then the follow-up questions with you know is this is this in shallow lakes or or really only in areas where carp are actively foraging what about kind of you know intermediate depths say around five meters where maybe carp are foraging some times of the year yeah sorry what was the question yeah i guess the question sorry is it is this a cautionary tale or, or what is this um, what do these results mean to you in terms of interpreting sediment chemistry when carp are present? Ah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's a good question too. I mean, <laughs> if you didn't know there were carp in this lake and you look at the black line, the concentrations where the carp are present, you would think that there's no problem with internal loading lake in this lake at all. In fact, there's probably negative internal loading. Right. Um, so it can be really risky if you don't consider everything that's going on in the lake. Um, yeah. 
So I, I'm, I'm thinking about one lake in particular. Actually, it's a lake that you have in a later data set, Centerville Lake, where we did some sediment cores and mm -hmm. uh, phosphorus release rates are in a moderate range. And I, and I think that uh, th sorry, these are new sediment cores, you know, after the alum treatment that was done decades ago. Okay. And the, re and the release rates, I think, are maybe lower than we expected, but we know carp are in the system. And I'm just wondering if there's, you know, we need to be careful with interpretation there. Yeah, you're probably underestimating internal loading. If carp are keeping a portion of that phosphorus that will be released during incubation up in the water all the time. Um, you might have better luck if you're collecting maybe just after ice out when carp aren't super active. But again, we did these in early May and you still didn't find much, or it's basically negative because these deeper points here in the sediment are background concentrations. So our surface concentrations were lower than background concentrations. So you probably underestimate uh, release rate that way. That's a really good question. I didn't think about that. Maybe one question to follow up on that and, and what you're saying, Brian. In your, your presentation, I think it's two more slides down. You, I think it was that you draw a conclusion between uh, what wasn't in the sediment was in the water column. Mm. And maybe to Matt's point, is there a way, if you do have carp, to kind of figure out and back calculate what is that load that's in the water column that if you got the carp out would actually be now detectable in your sediment? If that's Yes. There is. There's an old study by, I can't remember his first name, Lamara, who was actually in Minnesota, um, where he, based on CARP, he did a study, and he came up with a linear regression based on biomass density. You could estimate the internal loading caused by CARP. So when I talk about, let's see here. I've got it up in this beginning slide here. So I had two calculations. Yeah, here. So I think Pickerel was maybe around 3 milligrams per meter squared for per day for internal loading, just looking at the sediment. Or no, it was lower than that. I think it was between one and two. or But that includes organic matter too. Um, but for carp, it was between 13.4 and 20, based on that regression. And I have, I, I'm pretty sure I cited in one of the, the carp papers that I'll send to Maggie, um, so you can find it. Uh, but it's from 1975, so I don't know how available it is. But it, yeah, again, if you want, if anybody has any questions, you can email me, and then um, I've got that in a spreadsheet somewhere. So I don't know how I found the article, but um, I think maybe Hal Runke had it at bar somewhere. Um, but yeah, it, there is a way. It's very rough. Um, you have to know an approximate value for the biomass density of carp, kilograms per hectare, or that might actually be pounds per acre, but it's almost the same. Um, there's, it's just a little bit different. Great. Thanks. Yep. Brian, this is Brian Vlock again. Um, I think that's valuable information because... Um, as you know, carp removal efforts uh, is a long-term investment and um, sometimes you're successful to get that biomass down. And in some lakes, um, you never achieve that 100 kilogram per hectare threshold. And so um, I think it's kind of important to be able to kind of take that into consideration if you're not able to achieve your carp removal efforts goals, I guess. Yeah, and so you can compensate for that. As I mentioned, um, if you if you suspect that carp might come back after removal, um, if you can't do a rotenone treatment like was done with um, in pickerel, um, yeah, you just have to compensate for that and have an estimate. We have some more research, which I probably should have showed. Um, we have a relationship now. It's only three studies, um, but you can predict mixing depth of carp just based on sediment density. I don't know how good that is, um, but that's something you get with regular sediment coring and fractionation. You can calculate sediment density just off that, um, those data that you get. So you could make an estimate of mixing depth just based on what you're gonna get from phosphorus fractionation anyway. So, but we don't have that out in the article, but I do have a figure I could send out. Um, it's not published yet or submitted. OK, 
great. Any other questions for Brian? All right, well, I have a quick question for you, Brian. Like what, what are the next steps with this alum and CARP research? And is there any opportunities for all of us as CARP managers to help with information or be a study site? Or how can we support you guys in your research and get involved? Well, I, it would be great, um, like this meta aluminum study that we did, it would be great if there would be a centralized location or some way to have these sediment data that people have, um, especially before. I don't know if many people go out and core after an aluminum treatment, um, but if, the more, if we had more of that type of data, um, that would help a lot. Because then you could, I mean, I'd show a few studies here with a few lakes, but it's not anything where you can come up with a general um, type relationship that you could apply to all lakes. But if we had a way to gather all this sediment data and if people started coring after the aluminum treatments were done, because then you can make these estimates of mixing depth again, um, just like we did in Coleman Lake. So, but of course the coring can't happen 10 years later because you have ongoing sedimentation all the time. So the sediment depth or the depth of sediment over the aluminum treatment will increase over time. But if we could get those kind of data, then um, I think that would help a lot because then you could have a better idea of, um, well, mixing depth in that particular lake you treated to see if you maybe need to add a little bit more aluminum, but then we could have more estimates on how, what different types of, or amounts of carp, sizes of carp, and then of course, shallow lakes and maybe lakes that stratify, um, what that mixing depth effect has on both water quality and then um, the aluminum treatment and the sediment. So I know that's gonna be really hard because it's mostly consultants doing work and not that consultants are bad it's just we're doing the same thing for fish farming here and it's all the data are with different consultants and you know they have to get paid for their time too and um yeah it just can be tricky but that would help a ton and is so, uh, like we we have that data here would we send that to you or the university of minnesota or who would be the best uh, source person for that yeah i think probably me Prejemic too would be a good one to send it to um pergemic buyer um but it would be nice we have these well though it's not for settlement we have national databases well i guess we have that in minnesota too um the mpca um it would be nice if they could add sediment but then uh, yeah i don't know if that's but if you want um we could do something like that and once we have enough data um we could look at the data and see if we can come up with better relationships for uh, biomass density versus mixing depth versus effective aluminum treatment, um, effect on aluminum treatment in different types of lakes, shallow and deep lakes. Um, yeah, I mean, I would be interested in doing that. I know Prozemic would be too. Okay, I, I feel like I interrupted another question too before. <laughs> did, did somebody else have something else to ask Brian? <laughs> I must have been hearing things. Okay, so um, yeah, if anybody wants to follow up with Brian, I'll send out his contact information along with those papers. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Brian, for joining us today and for sharing yeah. all your research. This was so great. Yeah, thanks for all the good questions. It's, uh, yeah. it's good to talk about. This. There's not so many people doing this type of work. So you know, when, the more questions you get, the more you start thinking and things pop into your head. And yeah. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Yep. And so I have his uh, um, his email address up here too, if anybody wants to just email him or maybe write it down real quick. But again, I'll send that over email too.